And we're back! Mr. Bones, we're back! Oh, I see you're wearing black also. Well, I guess you could say we're back with smiles on, ready to teach the Word of God! And I gotta tell you, I'm glad to be back because this is so exciting. We are gonna push that excitement level chart to the very top. This bride is on fire! Now, here's the thing. This is part five. Five, five, five which is actually kind of like a part six of our three-part series, which has actually gone to part seven, which will be next. But it's three-part series, so you must watch all the parts. And I'm seeing that some videos, like number two, is being underwatched, and then we're hearing questions that are covered. We're, we're hearing the questions that we're getting are, are showing and revealing that people aren't, aren't watching all of them because we cover them all. So this is building line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Just like the Bible. You can't get the whole picture unless you read all the books. So you can't say, well, I'm gonna skip this here section and then expect to get the full understanding. So. This is your encouragement. If you haven't watched the parts, watch all of them. Number, number one is watch all of them. Number two is these, these are like a master class. This is like a college class. You can't expect to just hear the teacher one time and get it. So if you still don't have firm grip on this, then you need to go back and watch them again and take notes, okay? Because here's what we're doing, Mr. Bones. Ooh, ooh, thank you. Do I get a moment to talk? Uh, yes, Mr. Bones, would you like to say anything? Um, I'm very excited to learn more. I feel like I really grasp it, but I want to nail it down. Oh, that's a good intro, Mr. Bones. Okay, so here's the thing. We have been given the gift of understanding one of the greatest revelations of the end times, I would say the greatest revelation of the end times, the end generation, like the Lord promised in Daniel. Seal up the book at the end generation when Israel comes back to be a nation after 2,500 years. I'm going to open it up. We are teaching on four major misconceptions that we now understand the truth. And we have the truth. The Word of God has revealed the truth that was always there. We just always were going on what was taught from hundreds of years ago. For 2,000 years, things were thought in a certain way. And the Lord unsealed the books and said, no, this is what I really meant. Okay? So here's the four things. Number one, Jesus did not ascend on a non-appointed time and fulfill no prophecy. The Lord Jesus came to fulfill Look, over and over, he came to fulfill. This is done that the scripture shall be fulfilled. He did not do one of the major landmark moves of the ascension to go back up to the Lord to be the first fruit of the wheat on what was thought of ascension day 10 days before the feast of Shavuot, the first fruits of the wheat. That's number one. Ascension Day was not a random day. Number two, Shavuot is the first fruit of the wheat, and Jesus Christ must be that first fruit offering of the wheat. Otherwise, the wheat cannot be harvested ever. Jesus has to be the first fruit. So, with those two, you understand now, Ascension Day had to be on Shavuot. The Lord God came to fulfill appointed times, came to fulfill scripture. So we have multiple scriptures of his ascension being on Shavuot, the first fruit of the wheat, Bikurim, the feast of weeks. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, the day of Pentecost that fully came after Jesus ascended, on Shavuot was 50 full days after Shavuot. We have the exact date counts. We've taught about them over and over. So now when you understand 
50 days later, there's another feast and it's a hidden feast. Real quick, there's a feast in chapter 24 of Exodus. Then seven chapters later in Exodus 32, Aaron proclaims, tomorrow is another feast unto Yahweh. What's this feast 50 days later? We found it, it's the Feast of Wine. So when you understand that Jesus did ascend on Shabbat to fulfill Shabbat, then you understand he would fulfill pouring out the Holy Spirit on another appointed time. And that appointed time, we got knowledge of hints in the Bible. What's this about the first fruit of wine? When did they do the new wine? When do they dedicate the new wine? And then we found from the Dead Sea Scrolls, as the Lord promised, the end generation, there'll be more information. And we found this Feast of New Wine exactly seven complete Sabbaths after the Shabbat. So once you understand Ascension Day was not a random day, come on, does that take much effort to understand the Lord? Once you understand that, you understand he did fulfill Shabbat, the first fruit of the wheat. Then when he says, go to Jerusalem and wait, he wouldn't have said wait if it was Shabbat because they would have had to be there. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait. And we also find Moses telling the people, wait here. I got so much, it's going to be so exciting. Then you understand it must be the next feast, which is the Feast of New Wine. And then when it says he poured out the new wine, it is not much of a stretch to understand he's fulfilling the Feast of New Wine. And Peter identifies it as we're not drunk on new wine because it's but the third hour. And at the third hour of the Hebrew day, about 9 a.m., that is when the high priest is pouring the new wine on the altar to consecrate the new wine. And you find out that Jesus fulfilled the exact pouring out of the new wine, the blood of the new covenant, which is the wine, when he poured out the spirit at the third hour, fulfilling it perfectly. And he said, that's not good enough. Let's have a witness stand up and say, hey, they're drunk on new wine. What a convenient scripture. <laughs> and then that's not still not good enough. God says, oh, look, this is what was spoken of in Joel to fulfill the scripture of Joel. In the end times, I will pour out my spirit. So now that you understand those three, Shavuot was not random. Shavuot, or I'm sorry, Ascension Day was not random. Ascension Day was on Shavuot to fulfill Shavuot. The 50 days, the Pentecost that fully came was the Feast of New Wine. Now, this fourth understanding, seven complete Sabbaths from the Shavuot brings you to the eighth of Av. And now all of a sudden, the most famous bad day in Israel's lifetime, which is still going on today, is the ninth of Av. And you see that the 8th of Av, the Feast of New Wine, this great day where the church was chosen, the foolish nation chosen over Israel, butts right up against the 9th of Av. And you see that the pattern is identical. And you'll hear me say that over and over because everything in this prophecy is identical. Okay? So now that you understand that, we're going to jump into the teaching, and what I want to do is allow you, I'm going to help you highlight the parts of the Bible that are the solid proof of this understanding of all four of these, mostly in the book of Exodus. So I'm going to ask you to get a Bible that's not very marked up, and Mr. Bones is going to hold a Bible over here, and so I'm going to teach and read, and then we're going to also highlight the Bible, this one's already mostly highlighted. And then you will have the weapon, the sword, to fight the battle, the discrepancy with people. You say, no, this is scripturally sound. The Pentecost, the day of Pentecost that fully came was the Feast of New Wine. And Jesus actually ascended on Shavuot, fulfilling Shavuot, 
as the scripture said he must, fulfilling the feast of new wine as the scripture says he must, and fulfilling the restoration of the Holy Spirit to mankind. The Lord Jesus started his ministry by being anointed with the Holy Spirit at the exact same time of the Feast of New Wine and the 8th and 9th of Av. And then he went into the wilderness during Elul to Tishri 10, Yom Kippur, 40 days of fasting, came out on Yom Kippur and read the scripture, stopping at the day of vengeance. He will open up the scriptures again to fulfill the rest. So now that you understand that, we're going we're gonna to give you the ammunition, and then also we're going to show you how to highlight your book to highlight the rapture. And then you're going to have a note on your Bible that says, this is where we went. Look at these pages, okay? And you can highlight and write as much as, much as you want. I just recently, Mr. Bones, I just recently rewatched the Left Behind movie with uh, Kevin Sorbo, you know, the, the latest one. And it's so cool. I want, I want to show you uh, some parts. I might insert this right here. So he's been searching his Bible, and he decides to Google for Bible apps. And he finds there are none. Then he starts searching for Bible prophecy. And it says, terms of service violated. Then he goes and grabs his wife's phone, who has a Bible app. He's like, finally. So the first thing he looks up is rapture. Nothing found. He's like, what? Then he looks up vanishing. Nothing found. Then he looks up the disappearance. Nothing found. Then he's like, what about that church I used to go to? New Hope Church. Account suspended. And the first thing he tries to Google, Mr. Bones, this made everything so clear to us. You know, because the question we've get or the rebuke or scoff we've gotten so much is, rapture not in the Bible. Well, guess what? When we're all gone, the first thing they're all going to look up is rapture. And it's going to say no results found. Because God has no intention of making the tribulation a cinch for anybody. This is going to be the worst time in the history of history. The worst. So they will have to pursue him and look for him. And just like he didn't give us any of the watchmen the answers easily, he's going to look for hearts and who will receive this? Who won't receive it? Those of a high heart, a hard heart and slow to believe and understand. Who will receive this? Those with a soft, gentle, teachable heart with patience that prayerfully asks, Lord, lead me to understand you. I want to know you more. For to know, know, know you is to love, love, love you. Just the thought of you makes our heart be true. To know, know, know you is to love, love, love you. And I do. Yes, I do. You do too, right? I do. Okay, so now that I've got the intro out of the way, we're going to use a timer to try to keep this video short, believe it or not. So, boom, it's on. All right, we're going to open up our Bibles and go to Exodus 5. That's the first place we're going to start. But first, this is the timeline that they come up with and draw in the movie. If you look close, you're going to recognize it. Yes, this is exactly verbatim the identical diagram that Pastor Robert Breaker, one of us, has used all throughout his ministry where the law leads to the cross and separates a new dispensation of the church. Then there's the rapture, then the tribulation, then the return and the millennial reign. It even has the three and a half year period separated just like Robert Breaker did. Does that not just blow your mind? They out there are watching us and they know of us and Pastor Breaker, I love him. He has had the guts to say what he thinks and say, I think the rapture might happen at this time. He is watching. He's not setting the date. He's telling what he thinks. And this has gone all over the world. Absolutely mind-blowing. All right. Everybody got a nice and uh, undermarked Bible? 
okay? Get some uh, Bible-proof highlighters. You know, regular highlighters will bleed through and it'll be a big mess. So um, a, a wax uh, pencil or, or um, crayon and um, colored pencils a lot of times will work. If not, um, a colored pen, a multicolored pen. Just don't uh, push too hard, okay? So the argument is over. The debate on is this right or not is one. The microphone has been dropped over and over and over during this series. And I have to highlight my brother, Tyler, at Generation 2434. We are in this battle together. And we have not done anything special. The Word of God has won the debate. The Word of God has beaten the argument against. Okay? We were just led by prayerful study to have the joy and the privilege of understanding this. And again, if you think it should have been a Bible scholar, what does God say? Not many strong, not many wise, not many fast win the race, but God chooses the hearts. And he's looking for the least and the lowest and the less. Joseph, the younger brother that was picked on. David, he had Samuel go to Jesse. Let me see your sons. I'm going to anoint one. And all the big strapping boys came forward one after another. And Samuel said, nope, he's not the one. Then the little red-headed youngest boy, it says he was ruddy, which means red. The little ginger comes up and he goes, that's the one. And Jesse's like, oh no. <laughs> what about my big boys? Okay, because so God chooses the least and the less. And me and Tyler, we're just a couple of fools for the Lord, and we love him, and we're not afraid to speak up. This is, this is quite controversial, but it's been one, okay? Again, watch the videos. The, the evidence is there. Tyler's done about uh, five or six also. Okay, so grab your highlighters. Start in Exodus 5. Okay. Exodus 5, verse 1. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and told Pharaoh, Thus saith Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. What's the main reason God said, Let my people go, to come and hold a feast. A feast is a moed, which is a appointed time. Come, and he's telling them this before the plagues, before the Passover, he says, you're going to let them go, and they're going to do a certain feast for me. And then they're going to do another feast. And then as the story of Moses unra unravels, there's one feast after another. Push pause real quick. Okay, I took that poster down so you could see this. Okay, so they came out, Passover and unleavened bread, crossed through the sea, came to the Lord, at Shabbat, the Lord descended on the mount and started giving them oral Ten Commandments. Moses was called back up to receive the gift of the covenant. 2,000 years later, Jesus would present the gift of the new covenant. See how they mirror each other? And then Moses finally goes back up to make atonement. Jesus went back up to make atonement, and he comes down at the Day of Atonement with his face shining, just like Jesus will. So we've got Israel fulfilling this one, these three, then this one. Everybody skips this. It's clearly countable. Then he comes down and fulfills these. See how beautiful that is? It was a hidden feast, okay? So what we're gonna do is just have you circle those. So in your Bible, circle chapter five, verse one. Now jump over to chapter 6 and jump down to our circle, verses 6 through 8. Okay, these are the four wine cups, the four promises, the wine cups that are drank at Passover. And the fourth one, you know, is undrunk and it's left out for Elijah who will come at Passover. So, verse 6, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out, number one promise, number one cup, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid you of their bondage. And number two, 
I will redeem you with outstretched arms. Does that make you think of anything? How did Jesus redeem us? With outstretched arms at the Passover and with great judgments. And I will take you to me to be a people and I will be to you a God and you shall know that I am Yahweh, the Lord, your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So for us, he has taken us as a people. As soon as we believed in his word and work and blood atonement, he took us to be a peculiar and set apart people. And he is our God and we are his people. And he has brought us out from the burdens of this world, Egypt. But there's one promise left. And I will bring you into the land concerning the which I did swear to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage and inheritance. I am Yahweh. That's his promise. So he, he did bring us out. We are spiritually already removed from Egypt, the world, but he's going to bring us that last cup to that promised land. And then again, back to earth after seven years to be with him and rule and reign for a thousand years and we'll be with him forever. So that's the last part not completed. Now we're going to jump ahead to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the Passover. So you probably want to highlight all of chapter 12. Okay. So the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. Before that, it was Tishri. The seventh month was the head of the year. They, the Orthodox Jews still call it the Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. But God says this month, this month of Nisan Abib, the first month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, on the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, and lamb for an house. This represents Jesus entering in his triumphal entry on the tenth day of Nisan. You take the lamb on the tenth day. You inspect it for four days. Jesus was inspected over those four days. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, representing Jesus Christ without blemish. And you shall keep it unto the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly and the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. When was Jesus finally dead on the cross? The 14th in the evening. At the exact same time that they sacrificed the final lambs of the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper post of the house wherein they shall eat it. So you would take a basin of the blood from the lamb, hold it at the bottom of the door. You would dip the hyssop in and rise up and strike the top of the lentil. And then you would take the hyssop and you would go to the side post and the other side post. Look what you just made, a bloody cross right in the midst of your door. So when the Lord sees the blood spiritually on your door, what did he do for Israel? He passed over every house that had the blood. That is the typology of what Jesus did. By us believing in him on the cross, which is a bloody cross on the doorway of our heart, we also are passed over by the death angel. Verse 8, and they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roasted with fire, because the Lord was roasted and burnt to completion. His head and his legs, and with the pertinence, <laughs> with the pertinence thereof. 
And I haven't said that word in a while. <laughs> and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. The body must be completely destroyed, spiritually speaking. And, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, a staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. You are ready to go. We are being brought out of this place. That's why this was such a great typology for rapture. But now we've got way better. This is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh the Lord. Uh, your Bible probably doesn't say Yahweh, but anytime you see the Lord in capital, that is the Lord's name, Yahweh. You can write it in. You can write that in. Thank you, wife. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon your houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I had a comment. Don't make too much importance of the blood. When the Lord sees the blood, that's what causes us to be taken and the death angel to pass over us. The blood is everything. Without blood, there is no remission of sins. And not by the blood of the remission of, of Jesus' atonement and what you do, the blood, when he sees the blood. Okay? Let me get back to that. Uh, this whole chapter. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast unto Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You think we're going to stop doing this in heaven? No. You think we're going to stop doing it when we come back for the millennial reign? No. Do we have to be gone seven years before the millennial reign starts? Yes, because the millennial reign is a thousand year millennial reign. We can't wait till the 6,000th year to be going. We have to go seven years ahead. That's where we are. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven of your house, for whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. Left behind, cast out, put to death. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, a holy dress rehearsal. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done therein, save that which every man must do to eat. That only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this self same day I have brought you your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in all your generations by an ordinance forever. He brought them out on self same day. What self same day? They went into Egypt the self same day with Jacob and his 70 family members when they went into Joseph. And that was the 430 years Joseph ruled them first and there was there was Pharaoh that that loved Israel and then a Pharaoh rose up that didn't know Joseph and didn't love Israel and that was their true bondage. That was about 210 years. I had seen a comment asking what self same day meant. Gotcha. Self same day is if you went out on the 15th that means you went in on the 15th of the first month. Self same day I brought you out. In this first month on the 14th day of the month you shall you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the generation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. And that spiritually speaking is we're not mixing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is our unleavened bread, representing no leaven. Uh, unleavened bread is pierced. There's little holes in it like your cracker. And it's striped with burn marks and is baked in the oven of the earth with no leaven, representing no sin. So Jesus was pierced and striped and put into the oven of the earth. So you're eating 
There is one God. There is one way. There is one way and truth and life. And remember the temple. It moved a little bit. Is it okay? Yeah. Remember the temple of God. The first door is known as the way. The second door is known as the truth, the confession. And the third door is known as the life. That's the heart in the holy of holies. That is the same way the salvation message enters. It's the same way you enter into the holy of holies. And the Lord tore the temple, making us able to go straight to the holy of holies. Okay. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation. Verse 20. Ye shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations, shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called unto the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take ye a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And take ye a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood in the basin. Basin? Top? Over. Cross. Yes. There's a lot of repeat in the Bible. It's because God wants to drive points home. All right, we're going to skip through this, this rest of this part. None of you should go out of the house. None of you go out of the door of the house. So when, when you believe it, it is for real, you're not going out into another religion. That's what that represents. And when the Lord sees that you truly believe, then you are saved and sealed forever. True salvation. When he sees the blood, he'll pass over. The Lord came not to condemn the world, that, but that through him all might be saved. Those that believe on him are saved. Those that believeth not are condemned already, condemned to eternal separation from God and death. So we need the death angel to pass over us because we are appointed to death. By one man's offense, death reigned. That's why the death angel must pass over. And it says, observe this forever. And when it comes to pass that your children should ask, what is this? This is in verse 27. Then you're teaching your children. Teach your children well. Their father's hell will slowly go by. This is how we train up a child right in God's ways. 29. And you can highlight and circle these ones that I'm talking about. And it came to pass at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And Pharaoh rose up that night, and there was a great cry throughout all of Egypt. There was not a house where there was not a great cry. Now jump down to verse 41. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years. You're going to want that verse. 41. Even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. This is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all your children of Israel in their generations forever. Okay, now jump to chapter 16. And of course, we can get something out of every single thing. But what we're, what we're really uh, proving here, these proof texts are Shavuot was fulfilled. The Pentecost Feast of Wine is not the Shavuot, but the Pentecost Feast of Wine was fulfilled in the fifth month. All right, jump to chapter 16 and highlight the first six verses. And they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim, and, and El is God, and I am in Hebrew is plural. So this is, they came between gods and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month, write that off to the side, 15th day of the second month, from their departing out of the land of Egypt, exactly one month later, the whole congregation of children of Israel murmured against the Lord. Wow, it took 30 whole days to start to complain. 
They murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died in the hand, at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. You're trying to starve us to death. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather at a certain rate that I may prove them, that I may test them. So the Lord brings you out. You're a brand new Christian. You think there'll be a little testing? You think at first it's rain and manna from heaven, but then it slows down and you're looking in your heart to trust? Read the parable of the sower. Many sprout up, but many fall away instantly. The, the fowls of the air take it. The sun scorches it. Many get offended. But then some, it goes down and into a good heart. That word is sown. And then the belief is true. And the Lord knows that exact moment. That is the moment when he knows you will never turn again back from him. That's the moment you're saved. Now I will prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So he's going to keep the Sabbath holy, and nobody's collecting on the Sabbath. And Moses said unto Aaron and the children of Israel, At evening then we shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. Okay, and they're still murmuring and they're wanting meat. Now jump down to chapter 13 and you'll see, highlight that. You'll see, and it came to pass at evening that quails came up and covered the camp in the morning and the dew lay on the ground. Verse 14, when the, and when the dew was lay, that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay small round things as a small, as a hoar frost on the ground. And they gathered that up and that was the main manna. So on the 15th day of the second month, you see they got manna from heaven and also quails. They got flesh. All right, now we're going to jump to 19. 19, we need the whole chapter. So highlight the whole chapter, but make certain special highlights at key points. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone out forth from the land, the same day, not the selfsame day, but the same day in a third month at a, at a certain time, they came forth into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up, highlight that, unto God. And the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Remember, what, why did he want them brought unto him? To hold a feast. This is the feast of Shavuot in the third month. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So he's saying, if you receive this gift from me, if you'll make this agreement with me, you will be a special people above all. Now they're going to be a different type of special people than we the church that were offered a different covenant. This is when he starts to give the proposal, but not the actual covenant. Okay. Verse six. And ye shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. It's like saying, we do, to the marriage proposal. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, and that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow. A day is like a thousand years. Sanctify them for two thousand years. And let them wash their clothes. How do you wash your clothes? In the blood of Jesus. And be ready against the third day. He has smitten us. He has torn. He has smitten us. After two days, he will rise us up. On the third day, he shall bring us to him. Be ready against the third day. For the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto this people round about, saying, Take heed to yourself that ye go not up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up near the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightning and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet, the last trump, exceeding loud so that the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended up as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked, quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon my, Mount Sinai, the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people lest they break through unto the Lord and to gaze, and many of them will perish. And let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds upon the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through, to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people, and spake unto them. Then we get into chapter 20, and this is the Lord giving the oral commandments, and he is able to get out the Ten Commandments. But the first part is, speak unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of Egypt, the house of thy bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt make no graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven or on earth or that which is beneath the water. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them. So he, he got that part, as first three commandments, and, and that's exactly what they would end up breaking less than 50 days later. Chapter 20, verse 19, highlight. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. So they literally said, they told God, Please stop speaking. Stop speaking. Talk to the hand. Talk to Moses. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is coming to prove you. And that his fear may be upon before your face, and that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near in the thick darkness where God was. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. And then he goes in again, You shall make no gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of gold. And then on and on. So, that's the part of the commandment he got. He appeared to them and scared the daylights out of them to where they said, we can't stand it anymore. Our Mr. Bones are shaken. And they still broke it. The strength of sin is the law. What did Adam and Eve eat of? Every tree of the garden? No, the one you can't eat. Strength of sin is the law. All right, now, this is where everybody gets lost. So, from chapter 20 now, you're going to skip chapter 21, which is more of the details of the law, and chapter 22, and chapter 23. Of course, read them at your leisure, but this is the part you're going to highlight now. At chapter 24, 
This is where we know that was Shavuot. We know that was Shavuot in the third month. And it was seven complete Sabbaths, which actually brings you to the full moon, the 15th day of the third month. Another topic for another day. Just know it was Shavuot, okay? Now, we're going to get a count that the Lord so graciously gave us to take us from the Shavuot forward. You can't choose to ignore it and then say, I still want to believe Ascension Day and I still want to believe Pentecost is Shavuot. Because this is the proof. Chapter 24 of Exodus is the proof. And he said unto Moses, Come up unto the Lord, thou and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel and worship afar off. And Moses alone shall come near unto the Lord, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses told the people, all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one, vo one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said, we will do or will we do. That's verse three of Exodus 24. This is another we do confirmation. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen unto the Lord. This is the Shavuot. So the Lord says, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu come up with 70 elders. And then Moses, you're going to come up higher. And that's going to be this period of time. But this is still this day. So right above chapter 24, this is Shavuot. And right to the side where you've highlighted verses 4 and 5 and 6, this is the Shavuot. All right, so right at the top of your Bible and also right to the side, whatever you need to do. This is the Shavuot. And Moses, verse 6, And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read it to the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said, will we do? They just keep saying, we'll do it. Whatever you say, we're going to do. Now, they haven't even heard the covenant. So this was kind of a boast. This was kind of like, hey, it doesn't matter what you say. We got this. We got this in the bag. And you'll see they fail miserably. But it's because of pride. Why do you fail? Pride comes before the fail. All that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. So, Shavuot is in chapter 24. There's the proof. Burn offerings, peace offerings, sprinkle blood on the altar, having 12 pillars. No mistake. That's Shavuot. Okay, you're going to need to know that. Then, then went Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw God. So what did he say? You, you guys come up. So we'll skip. It's, this is kind of like you need another mountain to show this part. But they come up halfway up the mountain to where they can see God's feet. But he said, you, all you elders, you 75 people, you stay far enough away. Moses alone will come up, okay? So they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. And upon the nobles and the children of Israel laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and there I will give you the tables of stone. So at Shavuot, there were no tables of stone, no solid contract, covenant, no marriage ketubah. This was a proposal. This is the marriage. The fifth month is when he comes down at the Feast of New Wine with the marriage covenant. Remember that. Bring the table of stone and I will give you tables of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. And he said unto the elders, get this, this is so cool, tarry here 
okay? So Moses on Shavuot performs the Shavuot. He's getting ready to go up and eat with them. And he says, tarry here. Jesus ascends on the day of Shavuot, fulfilling the first fruit of the wheat. And right before he goes, he gives commandments and he gives instruction. Go to Jerusalem and tarry there. Don't leave till you receive the gift. Moses said, tarry here. Wait till I come back with the marriage covenant. Jesus goes up on Shavuot, fulfilling the first fruit of the wheat. He says, tarry, go to Jerusalem and tarry there till you receive the gift. It'll come at an appointed time. Let's just read that again, shall we? And he said unto the elders, tarry here, tarry ye here for us until we come again to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. Wow, what about all the other guys? Aaron and her, what, where, where'd her come from? Two witnesses were there. Terry, you here? Two witnesses. Jesus ascended. What happened? He says, Terry, you in Jerusalem. What happened? Two witnesses show up. God has given us a play-by-play, -play, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, proof that we understand this. Tarry you here until we come again. Behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have matters to do, let him come unto him. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. Moses went up, and a cloud received him. Jesus ascended on the exact same day, and a cloud received him. And then there were two witnesses. And the glory of the Lord abode upon the Mount Sinai, and it covered, and the cloud covered it six days. And in the seventh day, he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So he was doing a little foreshadowing, and now this is actually when it happened. After they had ate and drank and saw God's feet on the sapphire, after that, the seventh day, he called Moses up to the very top to go into the cloud. Joshua went with him, but stood afar off. So, verse 16, this is huge. Double highlight, words off to the side, six and seven. This is how you get the count. So we already had the next day after, after the Shavuot, or, well, he does the Shavuot offering, okay? So the Lord descended on the actual day of Shavuot, and we know Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is longer than just one day. So he's making the offering in the second day or third or both. So we got one or two days at least. Then seven days of eating and drinking. So you're gonna write a two next to the offering of Shavuot, then a seven next to the days they ate and drank with the elders, which is verse 16. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was a devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. So add two plus seven plus 40. All right, here we have three, but you know it's at least two plus seven plus 40. That brings you, that's about 49 days. That's like seven complete Sabbaths, okay? And then we're gonna cover the last day, the 50th day with Aaron, all right? So that's chapter, that's the end of chapter 24. That whole chapter is the majority of the proof, but you have to understand God's appointed times from the book of Leviticus and the seven complete Sabbaths to really put it together solid. Now, chapter 25, you're gonna skip. Chapter 26, you're gonna skip. Again, read these at your leisure. This is the law and how to build the tabernacle. Details not necessary to this understanding. Skip chapter 27 and chapter 28, chapter 29, chapter 30, chapter 31. Some critical things in here, but not necessary for this. Now, chapter 32. Bingo. Starting with verse 1, we're going to read this whole chapter. Highlight this whole chapter, 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, didn't God say, I brought you out on eagle's wings? This man who brought us, we wot not what is become of him. We know not the day or the hour he's coming back. So we're busy with our life. 
make us gods. I have to occupy myself in this world. I can't be bothered with this. Nobody knows the day or the hour. I don't want to know. It's the exact same attitude. They, he told them, wait. They knew a feast is coming up. They could have used a little knowledge and say, well, it's probably going to be that next feast, right? But I digress. That was a good digression. <laughs> we want not what is become of him. Up. This is how Israel's... Uh, how they talk to each other when, when they were going to create an action. Up! Come to me. Up! Make us gods. That'll be important in a few verses. And Aaron said unto them, Break off your golden earrings, golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons. <gasps> sons with earrings? Oh, pray tell. I thought that was a sin. Which are in your ears of your wives and your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. How, how, you know, there could have been much more gold. But break off the earring, which is like a covenant with God, so we don't, you don't have your hearing. And Israel, if you spell that out, has the word ear backwards. Every detail the Lord put in on purpose. So they are breaking off their listening to the Lord. He received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool making a graven image out of gold, which he was just told not to do. After that, he had made it a molten calf, and they said, he, and they said, These be thy gods, this golden calf, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Wow. I just can't believe they say stuff like this. It, it is amazing, but again, they were chosen to be the stiff-necked, stubborn, murmuring group to... Allow God to use them to bring forth salvation to the world. So, here's the part. This is critical. This is chapter 32, verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar. Remember, Moses built an altar at Shavuot. And he had pillars, and they had burnt offerings and, and peace offerings and blood. Okay? Okay. Aaron, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation. How do you make proclamation? You go to the highest point of the camp, and you blow trumpets, and you say, everybody come and listen. And said, tomorrow is a feast unto Yahweh. Feast unto Yahweh. Or here. Feast unto Yahweh. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And that word drink is imbibe, as in an intoxicating beverage of wine. What feast is this? It's not the Feast of Shavuot. we got 50 days. From the temple documents, we know the second feast is at the season that the crop grows naturally. So God had his appointed times that he set before the beginning of the world. He sat down, spiritually speaking, thought out and planned everything before he created the world. And he made appointed times that he would do everything. And then he had the world, the earth, bring forth according to his appointed times. Why do you think barley grows here? And then wheat grows here. And then wine doesn't grow until here. And that oil isn't available from the olives until here. Why do you think that? Because the Lord made it happen. So they sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people. Now this is funny because the Lord's being a little rascally here too. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves, even though he know he burned them out. They have turned us up. When they're bad, they're yours. <laughs> and then Moses is like, they're worse, they're yours. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them, and they have made a molten calf, and they have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel. So he heard. He heard every word, and he does. These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that they that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So, he says, and this is, again, on the ninth of Av, which we'll confirm in a little bit, but this is on the ninth of Av, 
golden calf, time of the new wine. And he says, I'm going to destroy this people, consume this people, and I'm going to make a great nation out of thee, Moses. Speaking of, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, Jesus. Everything. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said unto the Lord, Why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land? You brought them forth with great power and a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak, saying, For mischief he did bring them out. This was just a joke. He was tricking them. To slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. <gasps> Moses, dare say to the Lord, repent? If repent meant what you all have been taught, to feel sorry and beat your chest, and go and ask for forgiveness, then this would be blasphemy. But re repent means, the word is metanoia, which means to change your mind, and also to turn 180 degrees away from false gods to the true God. Repentance is a one-time, permanent, and continual state. Turn from thy wrath. Repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord, Yahweh, repented of the evil. He changed his mind which he already knew he was going to beforehand, but he had Moses play the part of Jesus asking for the atonement and repent of this death that was appointed. Okay? See how Moses is playing the part of Jesus. Jesus will come and fulfill everything that Moses prophesied. And the Lord Yahweh repented. Repent is not feeling sorry for wrongdoing. That's blasphemy. The Lord did not do wrong. He was exactly right. He changed his mind. Repented of the evil he thought to do unto this people. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and, and with the two tables of the testimony were in his hands. The tables were written on both sides. In, in the book of Revelation, the, the scroll is written on both sides, sealed with seven, scroll, seven seals. Written on both sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writings were the writings of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery. Yeah, we're winning a war. Nor is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. Oh no, we're losing a war. But this is the noise of them that do sing, I do hear. And again, this translation has been messed with a little bit. The word from the Greek Septuagint, which was 200 plus years before Jesus walked the earth, Jesus quoted from it over and over. All his disciples would have known of that work and used that as their study. So in the Septuagint, it says, that's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but this is the noise of them that have started the banquet of wine. The word yayin in Hebrew, which is onyos in Greek. Highlight that part. That's the part. Look, it was hidden on purpose. This is a hidden feast to be revealed at the end times. We were the ones that were supposed to understand this, not the last 2,000 years. This is the banquet of wine. So. You're in chapter 32. Aaron says, there's a feast unto Yahweh. They do burnt offerings and peace offerings, and they make sacrifices, and they're drinking wine and eating and playing. This is a feast. Okay? Then you go back. Go back. This is chapter 32. Go back. 31, 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. You're back in 24. Go back up where you wrote Shavuot, off to the side. Chapter 24, 4, verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning. Remember, it's the next day after. And built an altar 
under the hill, Aaron builds an altar and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. And he sent young men of the children of Israel, which offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings. And he's going to read the entire book that they had thus far and sprinkle blood on the book and the altar and the people. That is Shabbat chapter 24. Now let's turn the page. 25. This is why everybody gets lost. Because there were three chapters of law which lost y'all. Chapter 24 is the bonus. It's the proof. The truth. Then, seven chapters of law. Of course you got lost. You know, we're not supposed to dwell on the law. It's good reading, though. And how to build the tabernacle. Then you get into chapter 32, and right in the first verse, he covers it. We know not what is become of this Moses. Up! Make us gods. Then jump down to chapter 5, or verse 5, 32, 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar. And he made proclamation. And he said, tomorrow. So we had two days of Shavuot. Then we had seven days of eating and drinking and seeing God's feet as a sapphire ground. Then Moses was up for 40 days and 40 nights. That's 49 days. And then Aaron gives us the 50th day. He says, tomorrow is a feast unto Yahweh. What feast is it? Well, I don't know, because it's not in Leviticus. It was withheld from Leviticus. It was withheld from the church for 2,000 years till the end time generation. And the Lord put it in the Dead Sea Scrolls to be revealed as a confirmation. We found it by just paying special close attention to his word and knowing that there was a feast of wine because the wine and the oil must be consecrated. The first of your wheat and your wine and your oil must be consecrated. So we said, what feast could be 50 days later? In this generation, we know about the Feast of Wine. Okay, just incidental quick point. Shing! You got 8th of Av is the Feast of New Wine. 9th of Av is the, ne is the next day. So it's a great and terrible day right at the sun setting. The twinkling of an eye. Then, if we go up to the story of Moses, uh, Noah... The dove is released on ninth and the ravens first, and then the dove is released. The dove comes back in and is held for seven. So then the dove is released again and will bring back an olive leaf. So the dove is released to go to heaven. That's us on the Feast of New Wine on the eighth day. Ninth day is their terrible day. Seven days of the dove being in the ark of us being in heaven later is the 15th of the month. That is when the Jews celebrate the Feast of Wine for seven days. So that's called Tu Ba'av, the 15th of Av. And that came from after they laid in their graves for 40 years and the last year nobody died. They said, we better stay in until the moon is full. And when the 9th of Av passed and they slept for five more days and the full moon, they knew the count was correct. They weren't sure. They must have been getting pretty sure, but they're like, well, let's just wait till the moon's completely full. And on that day, they created the second greatest feast in Israel's history after the tabernacles, which is the Feast of Wine. And that is when the curse on Benjamin, which Benjamin was almost eliminated from the 12 tribes, that was reversed and they could marry and they would go and grab virgins dancing in white in the wine vineyards. And snatch him and say, you're my wife. And she's like, I actually wanted that guy. No, you're my wife. I chose you. Okay? So this is Israel will get their feast of wine later. Isn't that neat? We have our unique feast of wine on the 8th of Av. Okay, I just wanted to, I just wanted to cover that real quick. All right. Now, back to chapter 32. 32, 5. One more time. Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. God gave us all 50 days in between. He's good. And that's undeniable. So if you don't believe that's a feast of new wine, you got to make up your own feast. But there's a feast unto the Lord. Okay? So, then God repents of the evil he was going to do. And they go down and they're like, what's all this shouting and loud noise? It's they started the feast of wine. And it came to pass, now we're in verse 19, 32, 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, he saw the golden calf. 
and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. So you all saw the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. Mill, you know, and they have, it's all the same day, you know, the Shavuot going up and getting the commandments and coming down. But now we know it's 50 days apart. That movie was incorrect, not historically correct. Follow the word of God, not the movies. But the imagery of Charlton Heston throwing down the tablets and they hit and they explode. And then they also throw the earthquake in there, which doesn't happen for a whole nother year. See, your movies might be affecting what you're thinking. He cast the tables, the marriage covenant. This was the covenant. He said, Israel, Moses asked him, will they do all I say and, and be a special people to me? Marry me? Yeah, whatever you say. So here he's coming down with the marriage covenant. And the first thing was, don't do that. And Israel was divided. When Jesus said, go to Jerusalem. Excuse me. Excuse me, Bonesy. They don't mind me. All right. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. When Jesus ascended on Shavuot, fulfilling the feast of Shavuot, being the first fruit of the wheat... Shavuot is known as weeks. It starts the weeks of the summer harvest, and it's known as the first fruit of the wheat. Unless a kernel of wheat die and go into the ground, it cannot bring forth much fruit. He's gonna bring forth the wheat harvest is Israel. Jesus says the wheat harvest is the end of the world. He says, let the tares and the wheat grow together. At the end, the wheat will bow down, then gather up the tares and burn them. During the tribulation, tares will be being plucked up and burned. And who will make it to the very end? The wheat that is bowed down and says, Now, blessed is he who comes in Yahweh's name, the anointed one. Okay? So he fulfilled that. He says, go to Jerusalem and tarry. Just like Moses said, tarry you here. And here's two witnesses. And here's two witnesses. And he says, wait for the gift. Moses said, Terry here, wait for me to come back with the gift, the marriage covenant. It's called the ketubah. It was, for them, it was the commandments written on stone tablets. For us, we received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and he wrote his commandments upon our hearts. But at this moment, the 120... The number of the church is 120, okay? And multiplied times 10 is 1,200. 1,200 in Greek is pillar. And pillar in Hebrew is 120. The pillar is the church that Samson will push out. They were all with one accord. What about up here? They weren't with all with one accord. The entire nation was punished for the sins of of that 3,000 that were involved. Oh, I'm sorry, I was pointing at the wrong mountain. Okay, right here. Feast of wine, the spirit was poured out because they were all with one accord trusting in the Lord Jesus. They waited there patiently till the feast and they got the gift, which is the blood of the new covenant. Israel got a covenant written on stone. Stone represents the law. He smashed it. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill all of the law of Moses and all the Psalms and all the prophets. I have come to fulfill the stone covenant. And I will give to you from a stony heart to a heart of flesh, a soft heart that believes in what I did. Now we are married by believing in the blood of the new covenant, which he said, here, drink this. Guess what it is? Is it a glass of bread? Nope. It's a glass of new wine. And when you pour that new wine into this old wine skin, it bursts the skin. And we are actually shining brighter. This old earthen vessel has the light of Jesus and the oil of the Holy Spirit, and we burst out the joy of the Lord through our earthen vessel, and we shine, shine bright like a diamond, and those like wings, like a crown, 
That's the works we do in cooperation with the Lord and the Holy Spirit and His Word. Okay? So, they were with one accord. Israel was not with one accord. Now, this is when Aaron's going to tell the big whopper. Biggest whopper ever made. Uh, da, 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 where is it? Okay, okay. So he, he smashed the tablets. Okay? And beneath the mount, and he took the calf which they had made, and he burned it in the fire and ground it into powder, and he strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel to drink of it. So they were supposed to re receive the wine cup at the Feast of New Wine of the marriage covenant, and it was going to be solidified with the new covenant from God written with his own finger on stone, and they were going to be married. Because of the dissension, not being of one accord, the wine was poured out. Now you get the wine cup of wrath from the book of Numbers, Numbers 5. It was specifically a lie detector test because not all of millions of, there was about two and a half million of Israel. Okay, 600 men of war plus their families. So everybody, all the millions drank of that. And if you were guilty, your belly would swell up and your thigh would rot. And that's how they knew who to kill. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not thy anger be waxed hot. Thou knowest how those are, they are a people set on mischief. Basically he said, You know they're rascally. For they said unto me, Make us gods. What else was I going to do? <laughs> Make us gods, which shall go before us. For this Moses, this man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. We know not the day or the hour. And he said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it unto me, and I cast it into the fire, and there popped out this calf. Mr. Bones, can you believe that one? Uh, I've told some whoppers in my life, but that one's so ridiculous, I don't even think I could say it out loud. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so air is a part of this great sin. He was the one that should have said, no way, we're not doing this. He was the one in charge. And he, he fell for this. And then he lies about it. Okay, but God lets Aaron live until 40 years later and on the selfsame day that he started to put his hand to make that calf. God says, Aaron, this is in um, Numbers 33, chapter 33, sends Aaron up to Mount Hor. Don't miss the name. And it was the 33rd place they had stopped in all their traveling. And he said, go up there and die. And Aaron died at, I believe it was age 123. So, but, but God said, I'm going to use you for the next 40 years. So, you know, you got to pass for right now, just like he used Israel. And I threw the stuff in the fire and there popped out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. So, Aaron was kind of playing both sides. He like, knew it was wrong, but he still, he feared the people. And we see, we see on the internet, people fearing the people and afraid to speak the truth to God. You fear one and you follow him, no matter how many people tear you up. So he made him naked. And again, when the Lord comes, he said, don't be found naked. So he came down, 8th and 9th of Av, to give the marriage covenant, drink the wine cup of the new wine, but instead they were found naked and killed. Naked like Adam and Eve were naked without God's... Exactly. Spirit. Thank you. Good, good point, Danielle, my wife, Danielle. Uh, she said, naked like Adam and Eve were naked. Yes, so Adam and Eve, made in his image, were body, soul, and spirit. When they ate of the knowledge of good and evil, just like eating of the knowledge of the law, the Spirit of God left and they were naked and they hid amongst the trees. Okay, so this is a big one. Chapter 32, verse 26. Highlight this one big time. And Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Where did Eve come from? The Lord's side. Where did we come from? Jesus was pierced on his side, blood and water. That's us. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So Moses is above all the people. Who's on the Lord's side? Come up unto me. 
The Lord himself shall descend in a cloud and say, who is on the Lord's side? Come up, spiritually speaking, okay? So don't miss this point. Moses gives him instruction, brings him out, brings him through the water, brings him to the mount. Moses goes up, Moses comes down. Moses goes up and comes down, okay, on Shavuot. He performs the Shavuot. Now he's up there with Joshua. On the Feast of New Wine, Joshua and Moses are coming down. Joshua represents Jesus. Moses, at this part, is representing the Father. Jesus ascended and became in right standing with the Lord, on the right, right hand of the Lord. But you know, the Lord God, the Father, is invisible. He's everywhere. Jesus is the incarnation of the Lord God, Elohim, Trinity. So now, the Lord himself shall descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel, which sounds like a trumpet. And he shall say, he's in the clouds. He shall say, come up here. So Moses is up there in the clouds, him and Joshua descending down. And he says, who's on the Lord's side? Come up here. That's a rapture typology right there to the word. Verse 26. And he said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword upon his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man and his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor that was involved. And the, Lo and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell on that day of the people 3,000. God says, I'm giving you all these clues of this being the Feast of Wine, but I'm going to give you one very specific clue. 3,000 died. He'll repeat that very specific clue with Samson pushing out the pillars, which are the church, and 3,000 die. And then he gives the very specific clencher when he poured the Spirit on the 120 of the church, 3,000 were saved. Okay? God ties everything together. Ah! Identical. Love it. Okay, of that people, 3,000 died. For Moses said, Consecrate yourself today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother. That he... Now listen to this. This is, this is huge. So right after the 3,000 die, we've been talking about this is going to be a great and terrible day. So this is on the 8th and 9th of Av. We're going to say it's, it was actually the 9th. The eighth was the day they were supposed to drink the wine. Now this has gone into the evening of burning up the calf and making everybody drink and everybody be stabbed. Ninth of Av. Okay, and this is when Moses says this, on the ninth of Av. So 3,000 died on the ninth of Av, specifically on the ninth of Av, verse 28. Now verse 29. For Moses said, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he, God, may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Here was this horrible day, this terrible day for Israel, but the ones that were faithful, that waited for the gift, God didn't forget. He didn't punish 100% of Israel completely. He said, sanctify yourself unto the Lord. You're on the Lord's side. Wait, I'm going to bestow a blessing. That, again, is rapture typology of this feast. The Lord gives us specifically the day count of the 8th and 9th of Av. And he says, 3,000 died that day. Now the rest of you getting a blessing. Verse 29, double highlight. And then right to the side, great and terrible day. And, the, and it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, you've sinned a great sin. Now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make atonement for your sins. So, great sins. Then Moses says, I must go up and make atonement for you. And we get a count. We know that there were some days afterwards, and then he would be up in the mount from Elul 1 until the 10th day of Tishri, Yom Kippur, and he would come down with his face shining to make atonement. Jesus will fulfill this same thing. He's been up there for 40 jubilees, 2,000 years, and he's going to come down on day of atonement with his face shining, he has made atonement. So we have the three feasts that Moses prophesied. And Jesus said, I'll fulfill the prophecies of Moses and I'll fulfill every feast. This feast is a great and terrible day. 
It's the day some were killed and some will be taken up. Some are on the Lord's side. It's the feast of the new wine, but there's also the wine cup of wrath. Every single detail is right there if you have studied the entire word and understand God's types, God's shadows, God's mode of operation. So I'm going to go up and make atonement. All right? So it's, it's just that clear. Here's 32. He says, that's Shavuot in, verse, in chapter 24. I got 50 days I count before this feast. Then I know there's at least 40 days here. We got, we got our timing here. We know he comes out on Yom Kippur. So we count back the 40 days and it says Moses was fasting. There's your 40 days that all of Israel fasts every single year from then on. So we know feast, feast, feast. Okay. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and they have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou will forgive them their sin, if not, blot me out. So this is Moses saying, not only kill me, but blot me out of your eternity. He's representing Jesus, sacrificing himself for the forgiveness of their sins. Blot me, blot me out, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whatsoever hath Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore, go now, lead the people into the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So, on the ninth of Av, this is all transpiring. He's telling the plan and how he's going to go up. But he says, nevertheless, on this day, the ninth of Av, I'm going to visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they had made the golden calf, which Aaron had made. After we get raptured, what happens? The plague comes upon the people. All right. Now, in chapter 33, this is so critical because this, this also has rapture type after rapture type. Um, we're going to kind of skip through a little bit, but uh, it starts out, the Lord is given Moses instructions. So again, he's given instructions on 9th of Av. He says, okay, this is what you're going to do. And then eventually you're going to come up to me for 40 days and 40 nights. But jump down to verse 5, 33, 5. And the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment. On the ninth of Av, he spoke. I will come up thee in a moment. We know that's the first mention of in a moment in the entire Bible. The last mention is... In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, I will snatch you away. So, in a moment, I will rise up and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments, that I may know what to do with thee. So he's like, put off all your decorations and ornaments, dressed in sackcloth. I'm really mad, and I don't want to see anybody trying to have a good time. It's not going to be exactly like the tribulation. Then, the following verses from 6 on down... We'll see Moses takes the tabernacle and moves it outside of the camp. And then God is talking with him. These are the days leading up to the 40 days and 40 nights until uh, Day of Atonement. So again, Day of Atonement is the 10th. Go back 40 days. That's a little one. We're at 9th of Av, so we need three weeks. And God gives us some time. Verse 7, And Moses took the tabernacle, pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. So he's saying it came to pass this and it came to pass that. This is this timing right here. Is it exact number count? No. We don't need it. And it came to pass, Moses entered into the tabernacle and the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man at his tent door. They were really scared. They're looking out their windows. They're like, I wonder what's going to happen. There's this cloud talking to Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. Again, this was a cloud face, not him. Because anybody that sees his face will die. 
spoke unto him face to face as a cloud, as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So Moses is at the door of the tabernacle talking to God. Joshua's in the tabernacle behind him, kind of like Jesus in and God descending as a cloud. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Representing Jesus. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, shew me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might fight grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Give, give me this sign. Show me this grace. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto them, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherefore, for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? How shall we as a church know that we have found grace in his sight is it not that thou goest with us, when he comes and goes with us, Israel will know the church found grace in his sight. So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. What a unique way to put that. How about all of us from the people that are over in Egypt and all the other places? No, he says, I and thy people shall be separated from all the people on the face of the earth left behind. God has given us a clue. This is 9th of Av. This is still 9th of Av. Well, this is a few days after 9th of Av. Okay, okay. This is a few days after. Okay, we're filling up this space. But he says, how am I going to know we're going to be a separate people from you and all the people on the earth? Then the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing as thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, Shew me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Oh, this is so good. This is, Jesus is going to come snatch us up and, and the, the glory of him is going to pass before them on the face of the earth. And he's going to disappear. I'm going to make my uh, goodness pass before, before thee and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will take some Two will be in the field, one will be taken, who I'm gracious to. I'll show mercy on who I'll show mercy, the one taken. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. That's why the Lord descends on a cloud, because anybody on earth that saw him would be instantly destroyed, and he wouldn't be able to do the tribulation as he planned. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Come, my people. Come into thy chamber, shut thy door about thee. And the Lord took the Shunammite from the Song of Songs and put her up upon a rock. And, and Psalm 27, he shall set me up upon a rock. So there's a place over here by me. I will set you upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, this is verse 22, it shall come to pass when my glory passeth by that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand as I pass by. This is another rapture typology right here. He's going to come and snatch us, put us in the rock, but he's going to cover himself, cover them with the clouds. He's going to have put my hand upon the cliff. And this is all happening right after this ninth of Ah. This is not, not exciting. I mean, read the whole chapter. I really encourage you. But <laughs> I will put my, uh, <laughs> my hand upon the rock. I will cover thee with my hand and pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face thou shalt not see. What, when we, when they, he be, comes down, the Lord himself, upon a cloud, and calls us up, and did it in Christ, race first, hallelujah. Then we, which are alive and remain, are caught up together with them. What are they going to see that are left behind? Our hinder parts. The Lord is so good. And the Lord, and now this is uh, chapter 34, just a little bit. And now the Lord says, Cue two tablets like the first ones that I wrote upon that you broke and be ready in the morning to come up. So there's been some time passing, okay? That doesn't mean the rapture got moved. 
because some are typology, some are date specific typologies. I think he gave us about a dozen. And this one is showing that there is some passing of time. Now he might have spoken these things before the passing of time because the Lord sometimes foreshadows and then also retells. But anyways, he is saying, I'm going to rise up this day. I'm going to smote you. Stand aside and receive a blessing. Who's on the Lord's side? Come up. Who is not with the Lord? Be left behind. Now, when the dead in Christ rise first. Okay. So the Lord descends, makes a call. The dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain are caught up. What's happening down below? There are people left behind. We're caught up, but they're left behind. The dead in Christ rose, but sudden destruction and many millions will die at the day of the rapture, the great and terrible day. He will rise up and smote them, smite them, smote them, smitten them on that day. So see the parallel he does everywhere. So now he goes up and if you jump forward to this is chapter 34, verse 27. The Lord said unto Moses, write these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the whole, and he wrote upon the table the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony. This is a second set, but it's the same covenant with Israel. And he came down the Mount and he didn't know that his skin of his face was shiny. And then he goes upon um, uh, instructing them on their new covenant. So, are we clear? The Lord had him take a lamb, put blood on the door, kill it at the Passover in the evening. The Lord Jesus fulfilled all those, went into the unleavened bread as them being brought out of Egypt. That's when Jesus was in the grave. Then he rose on the third day and brought them through the Red Sea and, and produced or provided the first fruits on the other side. Then he walked with them for seven Sabbaths. This is Jesus fulfilling all these. Walked for seven Sabbaths, fulfilled the, the first fruit of the wheat, the Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, then we had two days of Shavuot, then seven days of eating, then 40 days in the top of the mountain, the cloud. Brings us right to the Feast of New Wine in chapter 32. Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord, 50 full days. Moses and Joshua descend. The Lord himself is going to be God the Father and Jesus together himself. Saying, Spirit, come up and then... Bam! Jesus said, I pray that they are one even as we are one at that moment. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Eighth and ninth of Av. Sudden destruction comes. Psalm 18. A lot of times the Lord will tell things in a slightly different order. That doesn't mean they, they happen exactly like that. Case in point, Revelation chapter 12. That's the starting point. Behold, I saw a great sign. Then the child was brought forth and caught up to the throne. That's number one. The child is caught up to the throne. That's the dove. But the raven is then released. What day is a Holy Spirit caught into the ark and Satan is cast down? Revelation chapter 12. The child was caught up. Then there's a war in heaven. Then Satan was cast down. That's how it starts the whole thing. Then you go back and forth because Revelation is written in what's called a chiastic structure where, where from the center it goes out and verses and chapters are related to similar themes. Okay, here's a picture. So, on the day, 9th and 10th of Ab, that is prophesied, the Holy Spirit goes out and comes in, the door is shut. The raven was released first in opposite order with the book of uh, Revelation is the child's caught up first and the door's shut and Satan's cast out and the door's shut. Okay, check out this awesome graphic that I had some help with from my brother Payday at Prophetic Watchman 88. Also, look how he updated the menorah to be more accurate. 
with the grain, wine, and oil in the center. So, this is from the story of Noah and the book of Revelation. And the door is opened. The raven, representing Satan, is released, which goes to and fro and never comes back. Then the dove is released, but the dove comes back and is in the ark for seven, and the door is shut. Okay, so with rapture, Revelation 12, door is open. The Holy Spirit is caught up. The Holy Spirit's going to be in heaven for seven. Satan is cast out and goes to and fro. And he is instrumental in the tribulation. But when Satan is cast out, the door is shut. So you see this chiastic pattern of A, B, C, D, E, and then E, D, C, B, A. That's the way God works. So you see that the last thing is the first thing. Okay, see how the Lord does this? And he says, I will call you up, then two will be in the field, one will be taken, the other one left. Well, we got the dead in Christ rise, then we are caught up, taken, they're left, and then the people on the earth die, and then we'll go into the grave. God mirrors everything exactly as a mirror. Okay, so um, I think we're going to stop at that point. Of course, we can go on and on. Um, I know I wanted to give you rapture verses, but just look up all the rapture verses and highlight those. And then put a little note in your Bible that says, this is where we went. Here was the story of Jesus. Okay, now you have the ammunition. You have all the verses when people say, ah, what's the verse that explains this? Well, you saw it was quite a lot. But, but now you have it highlighted in your fresh own new Bible and then we can highlight the other things. And I will see you in part six. I, the stuff I got is so wonderful. I just want to tell you, the book of Joshua is a mirror, okay, mirror to the book of Revelation. So that means the first thing that happens in Revelation, again, it's not written in start to finish order, but the first thing that happens in the book of Joshua is opposite of what happens in, in the, okay, the first thing that happens in the book of Joshua till the last now mirrors the book of Revelation. The first thing with Revelation is the child is caught up. The last thing in the book of Joshua is Caleb, Caleb the Gentile, the Kenizzite, gets his land on the ninth of Av. On the eighth and ninth of Av, Joshua enters the land. And in the book of Revelation, the child is caught up. Then the rest of Israel gets their land. And Israel gets Satan. Okay? So when Joshua, he brings them to the side Jordan. Then they cross over Jordan. Then they hold Passover. This is all right here. They cross over Jordan. Then they hold Passover. Then they see Jesus, the captain of the guard, with the sword. Then they march. They make the promise with Rahab. Then they march seven times around is, uh, Jericho, and Jericho falls. Then there's seven years of tribulation. We prove that in other chapters. But it has to do with uh, uh, Caleb's age, being 85. So seven years of tribulation. Now, with the, and then Caleb gets his land. Okay? Now reverse the book of Revelation. The Gentile gets his land. Then there's seven years of tribulation. Then we pass around Jericho seven times and everything falls. But go in and get Rahab. Rahab means large or lot. Okay? And she has the red cord because now she believes in the blood atonement of Jesus. And all of her family and all her possessions were brought out. And then they see Jesus with the sword. Then they hold Passover together. And they cross over and now are forever with the Lord. Mirror. Identical. Okay, I just wanted to throw that part in. I have, I have a whole bunch more. Um, yeah, I'm just going to have to stop. But, but uh, uh, no, 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 thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, oh, one more, one more chiastic structure. One more uh, of the typology where it goes forward and then backwards. Jesus in Matthew 24, he says, See ye here? They said, look at this great temple. He says, see there that temple? Not one stone will be left upon another. When's this time? When's the end of the world? Well, be careful nobody deceives you. Okay? So, what do we have? We have deception, and then not one stone. 
the Lord says, are ye not lively stones? Okay, ye are the temple of God. Not one lively stone will be left upon another. Your temple will be destroyed. But we get raptured as the lively stones and they build their temple. So you see, he said, temple's going to be gone, not one stone upon another, and many people deceive. We've got much deception. Not one stone will be, well, now we're going to build the temple, okay? So that's, that's how God is doing everything. And, and when you can see these patterns in, in different books, you can kind of know what to expect. So this is the one I got from uh, our buddies at unsealed.org. And I, what I did was I made just a little addition to it. This is uh, uh, Gary and Jeff at unsealed.org. And, and they, they came up with this understanding from the false millennial reign all the way down and, and going this way and then coming back. And uh, I'm going to have to read this one because I just wrote it. Thank you, Petey, for your help on making this graph. Here it is. All right, check this out. Screen capture this and take some time studying it. It's awesome. So, World War II was our example. And Hitler was our example of Satan. So the first thing, they established this false millennium. Remember, the Third Reich was going to be a thousand year reign. And Adolf Hitler, the one world leader, rise up. There's a world war and a holocaust. Then the global government rose up. The UN was founded. You know, everybody uniting as one. Then we had the Roswell incident and aliens crash landed. Then Israel declares independence. A physical nation was born in one day. But after that, Israel's branch put forth leaves, as it says in Matthew 24, 32. So now, how will it go in reverse? First thing, church, which is the grafted branch of Israel, leaves. The grafted branch leaves. The branch put forth leaves, and now the grant, grafted branch leaves. I love it. First Thessalonians 4, 16. Okay? Then after we leave, what's going to happen? Scattered Israel will be gathered back to Jerusalem during the tribulation, and they're going to build their temple. But Satan will be cast down and his angels, and now we're going to have the alien deception. The global government and the beast forms from Revelation 13... The Antichrist, the World War III, the final Holocaust. And then how will it all wrap up? Jesus will bring the true millennial reign. Christ's Davidic reign will be established. So that which has been done will be done again. There is no new thing under the sun. Check it out. Okay, so we know what's ahead of us and what is gonna happen, so we know what's, what must happen first. And there's so much more. Tune in for part six, but this will be after my second live with Brother Tyler at Generation 2434. Also check out this breaking news. My brother Aaron from God A Minute came all the way down from Canada to South Kakalaki, and we had a powwow about the years we are proving out the 2030 end and Jesus return. Seven years before that is right where we're at, folks. So we had a great talk and uh, we filmed it before a live studio audience. And uh, what we're going to do is premiere it live Thursday night, the 29th at 8 p.m. And uh, so it's previously recorded, but we'll be live in the chat. You guys will be able to ask questions uh, as long as you pay attention and you're courteous. Okay, so check it out. Thank you all for your attention. Again, if you have any doubts, the work has been done. The argument's been won. The debate is over. The microphone has been dropped. Take out your sword and fight. Wife? Excuse me, Mr. Bones. I'll defend your honor. Shing! Oh, you're better than I am. <laughs> but I'm not. Oh, yeah, I am right-handed. <laughs> uh, we kind of blew it. But anyways, sword sharpeneth sword. Shing! Thank you, lovely wife. Danielle. 
Okay. <laughs> Man, I got a rip for that one. Okay, good. Um, ah, blessings. The one about God waits. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So everything that the Lord did, he already prophesied. He already said what order it would go. We now know the order it should happen, which is rapture first, then the deception, the temple being built because the temple was destroyed, then the Antichrist, then they're heading towards the false millennial reign. Okay, so the Lord is not up there waiting on man to do anything. We've heard this over the years. Oh, they're waiting till the third temple is, is built. Oh, they have to wait till the Antichrist shows himself. The Lord's not up there saying, well, I sure wish they'd get to work on that temple because I can't come until, or I can't come till the Antichrist, the man of sin, reveals himself, or I can't come till this or that. The Lord does not wait on man. The Lord does not wait. He orchestrates. So he has caused everything to happen. He caused them to have a mark that has 666. He caused them to create the AI. He caused them to move towards a one world government, a one world religion, a one world tracking of every single cent you spend so that you will not be able to buy or sell. So the Lord himself chose the day of the rapture. It was appointed before he created the earth and it was a hidden feast. It was not the obvious Passover resurrection. It was not the obvious, very specific feast of Shavuot. It was not the fall feast with tabernacles and trumpets. It was not the Hanukkah, but he made very specific notation. It is the feast of new wine. And he said, this is the blood of my new covenant, which is new wine, which will burst your new wine skins. Okay? So, remember this. Write it down. God doesn't wait. He orchestrates. And I'll see you next time. Bye. Mr. Bones, you got anything to say? Um, well, I was back in black, but I uh, hit the sack. You know, I am glad to be back. <laughs> My wife's like, you can't say that after all this. Now bring up that excitement chart. Yes, sir. Where are we at, Mr. Bones? This bride is on fire. I agree. This bride is on fire. And this teaching is on fire. Tune in to Generation 2434 for a special guest, Mr. Bones and Tyler. <laughs> You really want me to take it? I think I can after all this time. Uh, I'll be there. Okay, over and out.